on classic vertical loop. And, you know, just as an example there, I wouldn't say that's classic, but that's the drawing of the loop that I currently have at home. Mm -hmm. I just staged on the whiteboard in advance. And that's a classic vertical loop. So, you know, the plane points up, and it's got vertical polarization broadside to the loop. We'll talk about later on, I've got a lot that's laid out in a very peculiar manner, and the shape of that loop fits the lot. And really, we'll talk about the advantages of loops. One of their biggest advantages is it's amazing how you can reconfigure them when you're limited on space. So, classic example of a vertical loop, good for DXing. Vertical radiation at a low angle, which is what you need to work the X. You don't tend to see these a lot, but you hear about them a lot. Horizontal loops. A lot of Midwesterners tend to use these. When you have a lot of property, and maybe a couple of utility poles on the periphery of your property, and maybe a windmill or two on another side of the property, so that you get four anchor points for free somehow, or maybe you get two or three for free, and then don't get it. Midwestern hams are not unknown to buy the FM broadcast tower of the local FM station when it goes out of business, plant it there to be the other corner. But the prerequisite is four corners. So what? Horizontal loops, they work really well. Well, Anna, I'm sorry. So what is it? What is, I, mean, I like the picture. I don't know what right. your neighbors think of that. Well, I'll tell you that story. <laughs> <laughs> I will mean, tell you that. So what is that? Because you know me. I, I, yeah. I, I, I like to come and listen. Right. But I took pictures. Yeah. And here's the thing. I never went over your house to do an antenna analysis, right? Yeah. But I will also tell you, I always do it in two phases. Phase one is with the husband. Phase two is with the wife. Usually three or four weeks later, when we come back to tune the thing and make sure it's working, and she says, is there a way you can make this thing go away or at least disguise it? And I will tell you later, about 50% of the time, I can pass the, okay, can you see it now test with the wife, give her a minute to look around without any hits and to fire to find the antenna. Uh, we'll show you the pictures. It's 18 gauge black wire, so it's coated. It's very thin. And you know what? When you see the pictures, you'll realize none of my neighbors can see this antenna. So they don't want to hang a clothesline. The only neighbor that ever commented on it commented after the snowstorm this week when what happened? Uh, the mixed precipitation up showed up on the horizontal layout, which is about 10 feet up. Uh -huh. And then you can spot it, but nobody was at home to notice it. Okay. So now, what is the horizontal? <coughs> I'm going to show you a diagram because I'm a lousy artist at using shade to show dimensionality, so I stole the diagram that shows that. Okay. So I'll give you a minute, we'll get to that. And the advantage is it doesn't have to be square. Right. Yeah, yeah, despite the terminology you're going to hear me use, a horizontal loop and pinch can be a triangular configuration, or it can be any kind of rectangle. What I can't remember from geometry, what was the term that you used to describe mm -hmm. any rectangle? Beyond, beyond rectangle, there's terminology for regardless of what shape uh, it takes rhomboid. on. Something like that. Very flexible in that regard. Magnetic loops. These are the fancy things you see advertised in QST, and when you go to Dayton for 400 bucks to 800 bucks, and they're used by apartment dwellers. QST this month has an article on one. Right. I'm building one. Right, you're gonna cue Dr. John. Dr. John's building one, he's gonna report back to us on his progress. But these are specialized devices, usually used by apartment dwellers or just by people who are fascinated with technology, which explains you. The club member that we had that was three quarters of the way to perfecting his loop, though, was Leonid. Right. So everybody remembers Leonid. Yeah. And in the estate, we had to go over there, and I brought it over, and you might have been the one that looked at it and said, that's the beginnings of a magnetic loop antenna. He must have been working on one. Why would it make sense for him to do that? Does anybody remember where Leonid lived? That senior citizen's development that's about five stories tall that overlooks Cummings Park, and his patio window looks straight to South America. I kid you not. <laughs> you understand why he would want to be building a loop. His loop might have been, say, five, six feet in diameter. They tend to vary in size, but these are not big undertakings, and it's not really the focus of what I'm talking about tonight. We're just mentioning it because about 50% of the time people talk about loops these days. That's what they're referring to. And what can I describe it as? Radio reception through the use of really good technology. What all is said and done. They use them a lot for hilltopping and. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to plug a type of antenna that I've used for years with great success. It's one of the simplest antennas you will ever see in action. It may fit the needs of several of you guys, and I've plugged them before. It's called a half square antenna. 
Notice nowhere there does it say loop. It's classified as a loop antenna. The cutting formula is 99.9% .9 the same, and it's just as if the loops, the end of the loops, drape down. What it accomplishes is even more superior low angle radiation than the loop, a vertical loop, and by magic, no matching network. When you break this thing right, you get a 52 ohm feed point. Straight feed with RG8X or RG8 or RG213 coax with no matching network required, so they're really nice. You also get some horizontal and vertical components. People say that. You know, <coughs> and interestingly enough, if you talk to the designer, he'd say there should be no vertical, or there should be no radiation on that phaser line. Opinions differ, and I've heard that same thing. But we'll get a little bit more specific when we get to these levels. Radials versus loops, or I'm sorry, verticals versus loops. Most loops are used as vertical radiators. So the question becomes, why would you want to use a loop if you could just use a vertical? Well, we'll look at it from this standpoint. A vertical, a real vertical, by my definition, is something that needs radials. They're either going to be on the ground, or you're going to have about a dozen, or you're going to have them elevated, at least have four or five, and have your neighbors wondering why there's wires 10 feet above your property that they sometimes have duct for when they're walking around. So radials make them difficult to implement. As you know, though, I've had a couple stealth verticals up at the Museum of Nature Center that people didn't stumble over until they actually saw me maintain over the years. Um, other, typical feed point for the verticals is about 36 ohms. So verticals usually require a fairly extensive matching network to match 52 ohm coax. They're noisy as hell. Anybody can tell you this about a vertical, they're noisy as hell. Mm -hmm. They happen to pick up a lot of man-made and grunge noise. God help you if you're in downtown Stanford, even downtown Grinch. You'll be hearing people's routers, people's wireless systems, and everything. Oh, yeah, I'm I was hearing, I switch between. Right. And and I'm, I'm getting 90% of it goes away when you switch to horizontal. Yes, it went away on horizontal. Right. That's the price you have to pay for a conventional vertical, where we're going to see loops are an improvement. And the gains is very poor. Uh, <laughs> looking here, though, they don't work well in Connecticut's rocky soil. Yes. What do we grow best here in Connecticut? Rocks. Maurice. Rocks. <laughs> this is probably the worst part of the United States to try and use a vertical net. But for just a second, we're going to plug Maurice, because Maurice has to put an antenna. And we've discovered now that your highest tree on your property is 30 feet. You live approximately three blocks from Japan Point. All right. That'll That'll work well. <laughs> Why would I recommend a vertical for Maurice? Stan has just seen it. He passes the two criteria. Are you stuck? You're stuck. Do you have proximity to the water? If you do, that makes a vertical even around here worthwhile. Talk to some people who have just fired up the backstays on their sailboats parked a couple miles offshore or even a couple hundred yards offshore and the results they get using soft water as a ground plane. So for you, that's what we have to take a look at and seriously explore. Now, what can I stand? What do I think are the worst investments of your money in ham radio today? Just about any commercially manufactured vertical you buy, but you may be stuck using one. What's their advantage? These are the $300 numbers, but they're the ones that come almost as if they're self-supporting towers. You know, where you're digging something in the ground uh, two to three feet to support it, and the thing goes up as a self-supporting mechanism that you just assemble, and up it goes. And that may be your best alternative. I don't think or they're officially- a wire in a tree. Right. Again, we're talking about a limitation yeah. of the tree, maybe 30 feet. And, and the house is a conventional well, two-story, full attic. Some, some of the will give you magic. Right. So 30, 30 feet of the gable is all we have to look at for horizontal. We can still get you something that works, it's just not going to be all that good. All right, so that's my comment on verticals. But remember, we're talking about verticals. We're talking about vertically configured loops or half squares. Just a variant on the theme. All right. Loops and half squares do not require radials. There is a configuration of half square for voltage feed that we use them, but 90% of folks use current feed at the upper quarter, and no radials are required. Vertical, polarization, and no radials. Think about that a second. What's the other problem? Conventional verticals are noisy as hell. Interestingly enough, the noise level is significantly lower, provided that you are getting the vertical pop propagation when you're using either a standard vertical or a half square. I'm sorry, Dave. 
standard uh, vertical loop or assware. They can be relatively inexpensive to build. I'll, be, I'll give you the budget for the one that I built, and you'll see that they're fairly inexpensive. The nice thing about the Hasquares, and I'll wrap up with the presentation on the Hasquares, though, is what we mentioned before. 52 ohm feed point, no matching network, straight connection to the coaxial connector, and you're good. We'll also mention, though, as part of our discussion of vertical loop antennas, the fact that there is kind of a new design. It's actually been around for years, but in the era of computer modeling, surprisingly enough, what they call the RDA design has proved to be superior to what we call the equilateral type loop that everyone strives for, where it's just symmetrical in all three sides or the same length. Interesting enough, models tell us today we've been doing that wrong for years, so we'll talk about the new RDA design, which again gives you superior performance and 52 ohm feed point, so no matching network report. All right, standard formula, you know, wire requirement, full size loop, 550 feet for 160, 268 for 75, 140.56 for 40 meters, and 70.90 for 20. I put the one for 20 only for illustrative purposes, because I gotta tell you, the main use of loops are you gonna find on 80 and 40, and sometimes on 160. Though they sound a little impractical, there is still a way that you can pull that off. Now, what you have to deal with, though, is that the standard vertical loop, whether you shape it as a rectangle, uh, basically an equilateral triangle, any of the normal configurations, it's going to be 115 ohms. That doesn't match standard coax either. There's a couple of relatively easy solutions for the matching, and it just depends on your attitude. For years and years, I used a batching network made of 75 ohm coax. What happened was this year, when I went to get back on the air, I had just gotten a brand new 2 kilowatt linear, number one, and the RG59 that the matching network was made out of was disintegrating in my hands when I went to inspect it at the end of last season. I was in a hurry, and I hadn't asked the wife for my Christmas present yet. It was five days before Christmas, and I'm like, the hell, and I'm not doing another soldering job with that crappy-ass RG59. Dear, I would like a two-to-one Ballon. I'll just order it, and I'll show you the credit card slip, and I did. So I'll show you a picture of the Ballon. That's the easy way to go. It's a good investment for you. Right about $95. However, that two-to-one Ballon can be used to tune any loop on any band. Me. Very flexible. So if tomorrow I want to put up a 40 meter loop, that bell works for me. When you're using the conventional stub type tuning mechanisms made out of coax, those are band specific. And so you're redoing them or creating another set when you try to do the transformation for another uh, loop antenna for another band. What do you need to do in order to make one of the matching networks? Can you measure some art? Some 75 ohm cable, this is the good old fashioned RG59 or the RG11. And can you solder on some connectors? Because what you'll do is order sort of a standard length, 50, 75 feet, cut down to the length that is required, and we'll show you the formula in just a minute, slap the connectors on the end of it, and then you're done. My problem is finding 75 ohm co uh, coax can be a bit of a challenge these days, but it's still available from specialty places like the Wireman or Adidas RF. couple of things though, if you decide to go that route, and I've done this successfully, it's not that hard. There's a formula that you've got to use to calculate the length of the matching stub. So, 1005, which is the loop, part of the loop equation, times the velocity factor of the coax, and what we've plugged into the actual equation is 0.66, which is the typical velocity for RG11. And then multiply by four. Well, what we discover, if you're not careful, is you can be fairly disillusioned when you go ahead and get the coax, cut it, and then realize it didn't confirm the velocity factor on the antenna. Because a lot of the stuff that's generically made in China, through no offense, this is not a standard they've got to meet or anything, right? Is using a different velocity factor. Some of the Davis stuff, interesting enough that they make fine coax, has got a velocity factor of 88, not 66. Just understand that velocity factor does not mean a whole lot with conventional antennas, but the higher the velocity factor, the longer your stub has to be. So, all of the things being equal, going with the RG59 or the RG11, that's got the lowest factor, which is about 0.66 on average, is going to save you some bucks. Probably got more than a couple of dollars.
That's why I was giving you the caution on the third bullet point. And like I say, to complete the process, you're throwing on coaxial connectors at the end. Most people just use the conventional PL259s, bales on both sides, and a barrel connector on each end, or on one end to do the termination in the 52 ohm coax that goes back to your ring. So remember, it's working in a series connection of 52 ohm, 52 ohm coax back to the rig and the matching uh, 75 coax going directly to the rig. What kind of bandwidth do you get in this I mean, your auto turner? It's pretty nice. See, I'll just tell you my motivation because we're in the same boat. I've got a linear. I want to be able to operate this linear at a natural residence point without using a tuner. Throw the tuner out the window from this equation. I've never fired up the two kilowatt linear. I don't want to mess around with a tuner. Ooh. I want residence, right? Here's the big surprise. What do you think I cut it for? 3.765. So I'm right below the DX window. I can operate on the window under two to one. Could still go way down to around 3.6 or there's a couple of the old timers nets and it might be valuable to fire up the linear to talk to the guys on the West Coast. But no, bandwidth is definitely one of their advantages. There's no question about it. Can you use it with a tuner on multiple bands? Yes. Yeah, and I did that. In fact, I think the first loop that I used for any long period of time had an RT11. You remember they were the first LGG remote tuners? And you know what? You can buy those suckers for 100 bucks today. And people are practically giving them away. They're damn good tuners. If you ever see one available, buy one. They came in sealed cases, and you buy some cheap um, hat-like cable. It was a special variety of it. I think it was actually DB9 in a null modem connection mode, maybe. And you operate it remotely. So no kidding, the distance from the base of the loop into the shack, 30 feet. And every time you switch bands, you hit the remote tune button and zoom, up it comes. I'll just tell you, you can do that. And so again, from the tuner to the antenna was just a short length of ladder line. It was coax to the tuner, the remote tuner from inside the shack. What I found though was this. On a natural basis, my uh, vertical loop, cut 480, operates on 40, fine, with a little assistance from the internal tuner, and gets out with a pretty good signal. So I'll talk about my experience in the contest last week. But I just don't know how much there is to be gained otherwise in terms of operating on any band, because on the other bands, it's not that good an antenna. It's better than nothing. It's better than a code anchor. But a lot of the signal strength, when you get to the higher bands, coming off a loop cut for lower bands, is going straight up and it's acting like a net the same time. So, yeah, you can do it, and I've had experience. It's relatively simple. Work like a charm, all the bands speed up. All right, so, we talked about the vertical loops, good DX solution, low angle radiation, vertical polarization, relatively low noise compared to a conventional vertical. Horizontal loops. The only example of a club member that I know of was Gus, all right? Now, it's too bad Ernest isn't here because he still, he still mutters about Gus in the time Gus came in here. Gus was a serious engineer who seriously took up AM radio. By the time Gus was done, he had four operating positions at his QTH just so he could invite his friends over to operate in contests. They're all CW. Right. <laughs> I know, but he actually he could fire up with the computer and do CW by computer. Yeah. So, he comes by one day and he says, I'll do a little talk and I'll talk to you about my horizontal loops, because nobody around here seems to use them. I found the definitions of QST, it's worked marvelously for me. Really, so Gus comes in here, this is his story. He's talking about all the software he uses to automate the process, and he goes, oh, and my loops. I have got a full wave loop for 160 meters, and it's up at 70 feet. Mm. Do you have any idea what kind of an undertaking this is? Let me tell you something. Uh, if you ever want to look up Gus's real estate, I'll give you the address because the house is going to be on the market eventually before Gus left us three years ago. House worth about maybe $3 million. He's, I can't remember, it's near, New Canada Dairy and he's right on the border, right? And there he was with all his trees. It's New Canada, he's right next to the Nature Preserve. Now that I think of it, he used to actually get away with running a couple of loops in the Nature Preserve before people noticed. And the wife, again, classic example of the wife whenever we came down to take down something, he used to love us. That's all I can tell you. But he had enormous success even on 160 meters with that configuration. Now, the diagram I'm going to show you talks about a more realistic undertaking. So remember, you'll get great results from any antenna at 70 feet. A 70-foot dipole on 80 meters will get you great coverage of Europe, and you can work South America. But here's the thing. For the classic person that's going to install one, again, the four support requirement, 
could be a challenge. We had all the trees in his property that we ever needed and gaps between the trees. So the trees are at the periphery of his property, which is the optimal combination. What you want to typically do though is get them up and around 50 feet, but that's a big challenge for a lot of people. But once you do that, you get an all-purpose uh, antenna that can really work 80 through 10 very predictably, and people get excellent results with them. Uh, it's kind of a favorite of CW operators, but that's as far as they're ever going to go with their antenna evolution. And there are CW operators that swear they've worked every country in the world using that configuration and just that one antenna. So they do really work out well. There are any number of articles, if you just look up, horizontal loop, or Loop Skywire was the term the ARRL coined for it when they first wrote it up in their antenna compendiums far back as 80s or 90s. The only controversy about these guys is, in the old days it was assumed regular 52 ohm coax was fine. And then they went back and forth, did some loss analysis and discovered, eh, maybe there's more losses than you think. So some people now recommend ladder line feed or a specialty ballon to do the magic. Uh, Gus did not bother with any of that. No, come to think of it, I'm sorry, he did use a failure in his configuration. Throw these dimensions out the window. This is a uh, loop for 7 megahertz in its <coughs> horizontal configuration. And it's trying to make the point that this sucker is even effective if it's only 10 to 20 feet up. That mm. doesn't mean that's the altitude you want it at. I'm showing this to you just so you can see how it looks. Again, Gus's was up 70 feet. Uh, that would be great for meter mm. meter operation. But for 80 meter operation all across the bands, we recommend 50 feet as a minimum. But notice the configuration. It's you know, a rectangle, right? Equidistant, four supports. I just wanted people to pull it off. They'll save a lot of money over buying any number of other commercially manufactured antennas that allegedly cover all bands and radiate equally well in all directions. This is where it becomes fun though, all right? Vertical loop shapes. Shape is determined by your lot. That's what it feels like. That's what you were to saying too. Thus, by lot. All right. I would describe that roughly as an equilateral loop, equilateral vertical loop. It's not that close. It's more like 85 feet, 95 feet, 100 feet, but it's close enough that it's far closer to an equilateral loop than it is to what we call an RAD. Give me dimensions of an RAD a bit later. Now, like I said, you'll see the pictures. Do my neighbors know that there's an antenna there? Nope. Matter of fact, a couple of my neighbors have wondered if I'm not in retirement on air radio because they don't see my antennas on. Well, let me explain. When uh, the Great Relief Act of 2009 came along, my neighborhood got new sidewalks. Guess what happened to all the old trees to put down all the new sidewalks? They took them all down. They took down maple in front of my mother-in-law's house, who lives directly across the street from me. Why a loop? Well, I used to have a dipole up at 70 feet that would cross the street, right? But I was just using the rope that crossed the power line to support the antenna. But they'll get the support rope put right over the power line. This is a temporary throughout the winter kind of operation. And I used to be heard in Europe like nobody's business. I'll tell you how good my location is. You'll see it in the pictures. ON4 UN. This is John Dave Oldair, the guy that writes all the low band DXing books. No linear, 100 watts. I'm wrapping up the CQ worldwide competition. He's the last guy I work on 80 meters. As he signs, he goes, well, that's it for the contest. Oh, hello, Mr. D. Voltaire. I got three or four of your books. I wish you were in front of me. I'd ask for your autograph. Da 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 da. Oh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. If you just want to hold on a minute, I've got an appointment with one or two other hams. So, no kidding, he's doing technical descriptions of how many points he scored, what the propagation would like. And then he says, back. And he says, yes. He says, please describe your antenna configuration here. You're banging my doors off. You're a 40 over 5 9. This is on contest weekend. What I haven't told you is, I'm up on a knoll that rises 40 feet above Scalzi Park. Now, despite what anyone will tell you, signals don't go straight up in the air. They get down on a plane, basically bounce off the Earth's surfaces, and then go back up again. If you're lucky enough to be on the rim of a hill, it's like the effect of adding the hill's height, the net height of your antenna installation, in the direction that you're trying to reach. And so looking over the roof of my mother-in-law's house, which you will look at in a minute, Africa, South Africa, Europe, all downhill from where I was located. I really worked out well with the dipole, then the damn tree came down. 
Hey, guess what? Not us, right? You gotta adapt to what you got. 90 foot oak tree, branches dangle over my neighbor's property. I wish I could draw in the other neighbor's properties because I'm friends with both of them. One of the neighbors remembers the ham that I bought my house from and the fact that he had wires all over the place too. The woman next door is a political ally of mine in town. I get to borrow her fir tree every year for the DX competitions where on her lot about 100 feet down from my oak tree is her General Sherman spruce tree at 85 feet. So I use a dive hole in the competitions to Europe, typically at around 65 feet. The coax does weigh it down. That's the alternative scenario I came up with, and I'll give you some of my contest statistics in a minute. I didn't work hundreds of stations on 80. Did fairly respectably with that antenna. I was surprised. I will also mention, because about half of you have heard the story, and if you had the story told you third party at the last meeting and chuckled, that's fine. But no kidding, as I was completing that antenna, fixing it after the first windstorm of the year, I'm going, oh God, the whole thing's tested out. I've got the perfect reading. Let me go in and test the thing. It's a slippery day. I'm walking downhill. My property goes downhill to the sidewalk, slipped, and on the way down, I managed to plant my hand at an odd angle and basically what appeared to be an extension or hyperextension of my left knee. I've been off it for six weeks. I'm finally walking again normally over the course of the last six to seven days. Over the course of the weekends, conditions were not that good. I reminded myself then, I practically killed myself putting up this antenna. I'm going to sit here a couple more hours and test it. It's sloppy, but it gets the job done. But can you understand what I say when I say it doesn't really adhere to a classic shape, but that is still a triangular or a delta loop by my definition. Right? The other angles or the other odds to this. You gotta remember, when you're using the classic delta loop, height. If it's gonna be vertical, you need about 45 feet on 40 meters, and the loop size will be about 145 feet. Get up to 80, that goes up to about 90 feet. And if you're using a conventional delta loop on 160, my friend, it's prohibitive. You're up at 180 feet. Do understand, though, that if you're close to vertical and you need a couple feet to stretch out, it's no great violation of the rules or performance to slope the slope of the loop down at an angle within limits to pick up the extra required length that you need. Right angle delta. This is going on for about 20 years, modeling, 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 modeling. This formula turns out works better than the delta and can be of an advantage to you depending upon how your layout is. I've got a tall oak tree, but I've got a limited run from that oak tree to the tree in front of my house. That was a limitation I had to work with, about a 95 foot run. What if I had a longer distance? What if I had a run maybe 130 feet? I might have switched the design. Do understand, by the way, I'm cheating on this configuration. Purists would puke if they really took a look at it. Because that's just a wire dragged through the tree branches, my friend. This is not held up by insulators. You see what I'm saying? At the base of the oak tree to keep the tension on it and to keep the matching section horizontal, there's one electric fence type insulator that the rope is just, or the wire's loosely coiled around just to keep some tension on it. But that's what I have to deal with. And the loop has worked out just fine. And the little tree there is basically where the feed point is. Understand the shack, which I did not draw in, is right down here in the lower portion of the basement. So no kidding, through a hole in the wall, it's 20 feet from my operating position. Right there. Works out well. And the neighbors don't see the coax coming in. That's just it too. The coax runs behind all our shrubbery. I don't have noise, nosy neighbors anyway, and if they saw it, they wouldn't care. They know I'm a ham. But, you know, you just don't want to try their patience over time. That's the way I would say it. And it's mostly my wife. So I think I've explained to all of you. The deal with the wife is, when planting season is restored, three quarters of the antennas come down, but for the duration of the winter, she stays huddled in the house. She doesn't care what the outside looks like. As long as something doesn't come hurling through her window, that's fine. All right. The other thing about a right angle delta, though, that we like is uh, shorter vertical lengths and doesn't require the two to one mallet. If you cut it to the formula, and I've tried this and it works with a 40 meter array, you cut it to the formula, 52 will match. No matching cable required, no balance required, direct coax feed. All right, rectangular. This is what you use when you have two support points. If you don't have two support points, you're using a delta by definition, right? If you only have one support, your alternative is to use the modified version of the delta, the right angle delta. 
but if you have multiple support points, you can do a rectangular configuration. Let's get back to 160. On 160, we're going to string a loop that's 550 feet on its outer circumference. How are we going to do that? If you've got a big piece of property with a couple oak trees separated by maybe 200 foot runs, it gets surprisingly easy, interestingly enough. And the trick is to just get the run going horizontally to take up most of the space, right? And then just complement it with trying to get a vertical run of at least 65 to 70 feet at both ends. And it will work surprisingly well for you. That's the main use for rectangular loop in terms of bands, is on 160. Because again, if you were just trying to do a conventional delta, be prepared to put the apex at 180 feet. How the hell are you going to get up there and where's the retreat that's going to support 180 foot mountain? This is all theoretical, but if you sat down with engineers, what they would tell you is the optimum configuration of a loop is a circle. The only problem is, who the hell is going to have the support configuration to keep the shape of a loop over now, my antenna, which is a total length of 265 feet, not possible. But now you know when you get back to the magnetic loops, which we said are used for situations you can't have a full-sized antenna, or for doing locational work. I mean, how was I acquainted with loops watching all those World War II movies where you see the Gestapo trucks trying to track the resistance operators, and you see the little corridor loops, right? And that's why they're circular. And really, their blessing is the fact that when you hit the nulls on those, you completely lose the signal. I will tell you though, it was a lot harder to catch those resistance operators than the movies would depict. You know, you would just see the truck go down and the uh, get a quarter. We got them. Oh God, no, they'd be going through days and weeks of triangulation before they catch them. All right, so that's the basic configurations, but I will tell you, you know, lots of determinant, and there's a lot of variants that are just what I would call hybrids, because that would be a classic loop by any definition, is the way I would describe it. I just needed something to string it so I could get a new net 265 feet and none of the portions of the wire would collapse on my line. But now here's the baby that I love so much and I have successfully built these. The right angle version of the delta loop, or the rad. The horizontal section takes up more of the run length of the antenna than the two vertical sections. You get slightly better performance but the key is a 52 ohm feed point. Again, no matching line required, no ballot required, direct coaxial feed. This is what's baffling about the design. We'll figure this out someday. Well, here's the, the truths that they always held about loops, allegedly. Well, you don't want to go too high up with the base of the loop, because that gets counterproductive. But you do want to understand that the horizontal portion of the loop doesn't do any of the radiating. It's the vertical portions of the loop that are basically firing against the horizontal portion of the loop. The vertical portions do all the radiating. By the way, the higher you can get the vertical components up, the better the radiation for the antenna. Okay, so explain to me then why the competing design that the models show is superior has a larger horizontal component, meaning that by definition, the vertical component is not going to be as high. But that's what the modeling shows, and that's what the subsequent testing shows. Where's the feed point? It's still a corner feed point. Now, I've got to tell you, Josh just brought up that one of the most raging questions about loops. I've researched this question for years. I'll tell you, there's all kinds of antennas out there where people cannot agree on cutting formulas, or they can't agree on strengths and weaknesses. All right? So we'll revisit that in just a second. But there are surprising strengths and weaknesses in the in all antennas. But here's just an example for cutting purposes, just so you can sort of see the net difference. 3.6 megahertz, right? Three equal sides, 96 feet in length for the equilateral, basically by antenna, but it's off by five feet, give or take a lot of dimensions. But listen up, you're going to do it with a rad, then the vertical components are going to be 84.8 feet, the horizontal component's going to be 124, 20 feet. The lot configures the antenna. I would do a rad with a higher gain and a more simplistic interface. How many feet am I short? Oh, I don't have the extra 20 feet. My run length is 90 feet. Thus, I'm stuck with the equilateral design or the hybrid design. This is a great way to go, though. If you've got the horizontal run and the tree, the only tree on your lot, right, can't support what's required for the conventional loop. You drop that requirement significantly because a greater portion of the size of the loop is taken up by the horizontal. Now, on that horizontal, right. does it have to be straight or can you put a V in it? 
People have done that. Yeah, so if you're running on a road, there are configurations that they'll show you in QST where the bottom part of the loop goes. In fact, you're looking at an oscilloscope as people have put in pull ropes or rubber bands through the bushes to, yeah, make it double back on each other without hitting one another. And yeah, that's an option. All right, so less height required at the apex and better radiator. So there's a lot to be said for that approach. Here's mine. Approximate length, 265 feet. Roughly 80 feet on the vertical component, 85 feet on, I've got a vertical and 85 feet high. Let's put it more as 80 feet vertical up, right? 85 feet on the horizontal run, which is actually what I meant. And 100 feet on the diagonal slope run that comes down from the top. Right, so we ain't close to five hundreds there and there, but that's the basic layout. It was cut. What was the cutting strategy? It was cut for almost the midpoint of the band. And I'll give you the stats in just a second. What dictated it? I've got that oak tree. God, it's a thing of beauty. I will tell you that when my wife first bought the house, because she bought it in advance of us getting married, there was a second oak tree on the property. And remember, there was a ham that owned that house. But he had an inverted V going down the side of the house suspended from one of the gables. He never cleared the back lot. And I cursed her off because I was a tree lover and I said, my God, why did you cut the other oak tree down? You know, now there's only one oak tree down there. The other oak tree took up the entire backyard. If we had never trimmed it down, I never would have had any room to put up any of the wire antennas. And this was the bigger of the two. So, lot configuration determines the design. I sprung for the balance. It was a Christmas present. I had nothing else to ask for. I knew that DXE would get it to me in time. 95 bucks, I believe, in delivery. So I had to show off the ballot. Uh, if you want to make the stub assemblies using the RG59 coax, baby budget 40 bucks for the parts. So about half the cost. More flexibility with the ballot, but understand too, I wanted to run two kilowatts BEP. Right? So I was unsure. Uh, one and a half kilowatts. Well, I'm just using the old <laughs> terminology, right? <laughs> when I say that. But a full size will keep believe it. Without having to worry, I'd be frying the RG59. I didn't want to go out and shell out money for RG11. That's all. So, in, in a way, the balance costs with a few extra bucks, but it does the trick. Now, the heading. The plane of the actual loop. So, let's see. We get north in that direction. If that's due north, running directly to the back of the road, following this line up here are the roof tiles, right? The antenna is pointing at approximately 10 degrees. Why? Because it's the only way I can point it based on the supports. What does that mean? Do understand there is directionality broadside to the antenna. However, you will still get significant perception off all sides of the antenna, except when you are directly off the sides, and that's when you'll get it all. So what was I hearing during the DX competition? Because that antenna is pointing really to the southern Mediterranean and North Africa for the meat of where it's transmitting its RF. But the extension, Right? Maybe the 45 degree points are going to go as far as France and parts of Germany, right? And then down into Africa. The other thing you have to recognize is, remember, it's bi-directional. So off the other side, it's the Caribbean. Oh, I'm sorry, not the Caribbean. The Caribbean comes for free with Africa, basically. But off the other side, it's essentially the Mexican Peninsula, for lack of a better way to you know, get it. So, I mean, I was hearing uh, Dominican Republic, Mexico, etc. So, I haven't gotten tremendous results over the winter, all right? But do understand, propagation is crappy. For all you newcomers, we can assure you, Stan and I, uh, Stan, what was the, did you go back to like the 66, 67 uh, at our sunspot peak? I'm just thinking of the great ones. I used to work the world on 10 meters from the car. Right, right, right. I didn't get on until the one, the peak that hit maybe 73, 74. So I was a little bit later. God, there were some peaks, guys, back in the 60s and 70s, when you could talk on 10 watts to a coat hanger to a guy in Moscow standing on the street with a similarly equipped rig. Conditions were that good. Don't get discouraged when you get on the air and hear nothing. Conditions are awful. Thus, why are we talking about beams anyway? Most folks are talking about beams. Has anybody heard a blessed thing on 20 meters, 15 meters, or 10 meters other than in competitions? That's yes. why we're talking about loops. Lately, you should be, a they've big, been... Right. Spring is coming. That usually augurs well for the higher bands. But this is why we spend a lot of time talking about loops at this stage of the game, because Low bands are the place to be. Where do you feed them? I promise to get back to you. And what's the bandwidth? Surprisingly good. Cut for center frequency of 3.765, which is just directly under the DX window, right? 
2 to 1 bandwidth, 160 kilohertz. No tuner for my linear, all the way down to around 368 off. Right, and with the addition of the ATR, can get the line and get down to some of the nets that are down there. Well, I'm on, the, I'm on 3680, uh, 3670. SSB, so I'm up at 3.9. Right, right. The upper point I'm not as much concerned with. The upper uh, range, uh, you know, is going to be up around 3, 4 off, right? No offense. The guys that live above there, they could have, do you know what I'm saying? I'm not going to use Tampa. There's some collections of really people up there, if you know what you're talking about. And I've talked to the New Jersey game over the years. They forgot I was once one of them. You know? Doing special. Really look at the AMers. Right, 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 right. Yeah. No, no, no. You want no classic what I'm doing? The AMers. Yeah. operation that we did the joint operation oh. with Gene Arc on. Well, and I'm on 3910 with the famous New Jersey gang. Why? Yeah. Well. It's the, the four, Jersey gang. The four we'll the and, and the Green Mountain. Yeah, no, 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 these are like the CBers players. that took over frequency after they all cheated on their license exams back in the 80s that belongs to them. They're at least polite enough, though, they tell you to get the hell off their frequency. But when I'm doing Kwanzaa, right? CQ, 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 Whiskey One, Echo, Echo, four Kwanzaa, da 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 This is a New Yorker on the other end. What do I hear? The line from um, Blazing Saddles. We don't need no stinking special operations on 3910. No, then he keyed up his linear. Oh my god, the speaker on my rig practically broke. <laughs> so I don't go to that part of 80. But with a tuner, the internal tuner, I can skate that high. And that's easily within the range of the ATR 30 if I want to use it with the linear. But you understand, I'm working <gasps> with the high power linear. I want to take the antenna tuner out of the equation. Okay. Where do you feed them? This is where the argument goes on forever. Sometimes I think I should too, because that's the is simplest place to feed. I use the my bottom. tuner with a linear. Right? Is at the bottom corner. People swear that gives you the vertical <laughs> propagation. But then there's the argument that you no, know, it's supposed to be a quarter up. Then there's the other side. It's no, you morons. Everybody uh, knows it's a quarter <laughs> down. No, then it's on the horizontal. They you know? There are places all over that that's the only way to do it. <laughs> no, what you actually find out is there's like a hundred different places you can locate yeah. them, and each will give you slightly different results. But one of the other things that argues in favor of the RAD is nobody feeds the RAD any place other than right at the bottom of the leg, where one of the legs feeds the horse. And I'll show you something. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's the easiest thing. So what were my results? I worked 21 countries on 80 meters. Mm. By the way, that's not an extraordinary performance. That's just me trying to work the antenna. Um, best year, though, I had working with the dipole might have been 14 or 15. However, I'm not saying the loop was superior. I stayed the entire contest on the 80. That was the difference. Where were the signals coming from? As you would anticipate, some of the Earth and the Caribbean off the back side, right? Or, I'm sorry, the Mexican Peninsula basically off the back side, the Caribbean off the side, off the very side, basically pointed to background. Here's the fun part, though. You get cute little surprises. Switched up to 40. I just worked everybody I heard an 80, 80 blind stale, I go up to 40. I'm not hearing a blessed thing. 40 actually died that night. For all of you guys that are around, where we tell you things are bad, Stan, I mean, 40 just died. There were no QSOs on the band. I'm like, come on, the MUF couldn't possibly have dropped below 40 meters. It did, right? All of a sudden, out of nowhere, this is not on the band. This antenna is optimized for It's on 40, where it should be a so so antenna. New Zealand! Wow. Very low signal, but very readable. My theory there is, by the way, darkness path. And I was doing line path and talked to him. So I was CW or the results. No, this is the side band competition. Right. Okay. Right. This is my house. I don't do much on artist renditions. You can see part of the branches of the oak tree up here. Here's the driveway. Here's the tree that's got the feed point. Anybody see the antenna? It's black. Terrible picture. It's black. It's 18 gauge. I will tell you what it is. You can see the power line. Right. Definitely. <laughs> no, that's just it. There's so much busyness in front of my house. It's the distraction for the spool of camouflage. You're never going to see the antenna because you're really what? distracted. Are you, you, do you actually powers. feel that you're in violation of something having an antenna? I mean, no. I don't. I have an no. antenna. Right. I, my vertical's obvious. Nobody's ever. I didn't make this. Here's my me. point. I'm not disputing anything you say. I'm proud of my antenna.